This is the Piliga, an ancient forest west of the Great Dividing Range. From the lookout tower at Timulali National Park, trees seemingly stretch into the infinity. However, it's an illusion. One that suggests that most of central New South Wales is still in its natural state. It's far from it. Central New South Wales and the fertile Western Plains are the agricultural heartland of the state and nature is no longer ruling this vast region. This place grows wheat, cotton, hay, beef, sheep and wool. Although through this intensely cultivated part of New South Wales stretches a series of nature reserves and national parks. Some are icons of New South Wales natural treasures, some are rarely visited. This is the case with Goobang National Park, a large reserve north of the regional city of Parks. We head to the northern part of the park and its cultivated land once again takes centre stage. And then the park boundary and the Saw Pit Gully Trail. This unsealed road lets us access the Burrabadeen Peak walking track. The track traverses through red stringy bark, red iron bark, and red gum woodland. And delicate fringed lily flowers peek out along the path. Further up, grass trees and cypress pine create a frame for the track. On top of the ridge, a large can marks the edge of the escarpment. From here, our view goes west, out into the vast expanse of the Western Plains. Out there is also Peak Hill, a gold mining town with its now abandoned mine and dramatic open pits just past its outskirts. Gold was discovered here in 1889. The mine ceased production and closed in 2002 and more than 200,000 ounces of gold were dug out of here. There are walking trails that lead to several lookouts. They're placed in strategic locations around the two pits. Our next stop is 60 kilometres north of Peak Hill, its narrow mine. This small country town, surrounded by vast fields, is all about agriculture and aviation. So I'm Peter Keirith, I'm the chairman of the Narrow Mine Aviation Museum. Well, aviation in Narrow Mine goes back to 1919 when the survey flight came through here from the Australian Flying Corps. Then Charles and, and Ross Smith landed here in February of 1920 in the Vickers Vimy and that's the photograph you can see behind you there and I think that was the one that sort of was the foundation of Narromine becoming an aviation town. From here, the natural stepping stone on the way north is Gunu National Park. This park and the adjacent Gunu Conservation Area, northeast of Dubbo, are the favourite haunts of Janice Hosking. It was being managed as a uh, state forest for a long time, but then the iron barks were superseded by, um, I think, concrete uh, sleepers, and so they stopped logging in here and so they handed it over to the National Parks uh, and Wildlife Service to manage. 
I've learnt quite a bit about the vegetation in the local region as a result of bird watching. Uh, quite a lot of threatened species, birds, plants, yeah, and it's just a wonderful place to visit. It's over 64,000 hectares in size. And now continuing north, we make our way to the Warrumbungle National Park. Then the first volcanic plug still outside the park is a dramatic introduction into a landscape shaped by volcanism. Our first stop in the park itself is the White Gum Lookout. From this perfect perch, the high tops, the main peaks of the park, are paraded in front of us. Then, rolling in thundery showers pull a veil over the peaks. Blake McCarthy, the visitor centre ranger, explains the genesis of this unusual national park. What we had is a, a sedimentary basin here, um, which is the Pilliga sandstone. And then around 18 million years ago, the continental plate has moved over a hot spot and underneath the Earth's crust, um, so you've had upwelling of magma and that's coming up through uh, the, the cracks and faults in the Earth's crust. And so in the, in the park here you'll see we've got a lot of um, dikes where the, where the magma's pushed up through cracks or weak spots in the crust. Um, also plugs and um, vents where, where all that magma is welled to the surface. So it was a, a shield volcano. Later in the afternoon, fluffy clouds begin to billow and rapidly grow into cumulonimbus clouds. Severe storms are brewing. We watch the drama unfold at the western end of the park. No mountains, only forest. The change of scenery to the north of the Warrumbungles is stark. We're in the Pilliga, and together with Aboriginal Ranger Craig Moore, we visit the sandstone caves. Uh, Yama everyone, welcome here to this country. My name is Craig Moore, I'm a Camilleroy man from Kinnabarabran area. I work in National Parks, I've been with National Parks for over 13, 13 odd years now. I'd like to pay my respects to the, the ancestors and elders uh, of this land and those people who are visiting here today. The Pilligore is a special meeting place for Aboriginal people, uh, for corroborees, for ceremonies, initiations. So the caves were recorded in the 1970s but in the 1990s, uh, they had the arge archaeological dig and they found peckings, grinding grooves, etchings, stone flakes uh, in, along these, in along the shelters and dated it back to 12,000 years ago. We're now travelling through the huge semi-arid forest to the Dandry Gorge at the edge of the Timalali National Park, another area of indigenous significance. A walk along the rim of the gorge connects ancient history with modern art. This is sculptures in the scrub. Five artists, indigenous and non-indigenous, were commissioned to create sculptures that provide an ongoing record of the site's significance. 
Each sculpture is the result of an artist collaborating with local Aboriginal elders on a piece that tells a story of the area's Aboriginal history and culture. Leaving the remarkable Piliga, we head to our next reserve, Mount Kapiatar National Park. It's about 50 kilometres east of Narrabri. A narrow, only partly sealed mountain road leads towards the 1,510 metre high summit and into a vastly different world. Like the Warren Bungles further south, this mountainous park is also born in fire. Fed by a hotspot, the Nandawar volcano rose here 70 million years ago, spewing lava and ash. The landscape we see today is the eroded remnant of this volcano. On the way up, we stop at the Dug Sky Lookout. The viewing platform offers a sweeping panorama over Yugla Rock and the foothills of the Nandawar Range out to the plains. Not far from the lookout is Koya Gap. This is where the Mount Koya walking track, one of the most rewarding walks in the park, begins. From the gap, it's a steep climb up the terraces formed by a series of lava flows. Here the narrow track loops around the base of the cliffs and enters a lost world. Impressive stands of grass trees occupy the narrow, exposed ledge and create spectacular scenery. On the top of the cliffs, just below the summit of Mount Koya, sweeping views over parts of the park is the reward for us for that steep and demanding climb. But now, to see one of the park's most spectacular reminders of its volcanic past, we head to the northern section. Hidden in a narrow valley rise, 40 metre high cliffs composed of pentagonal columns of basalt is saw rock. Originally hidden underground, a small creek over time cut into the basalt lava flow and exposed this geological wonder. Like all other reserves along this journey, it's also an island of wilderness in a vast sea of cultivated land. Small in comparison, but all the more important. 